Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Tatayma Virtual Pilgrimage. My name is Rob Busher, and I'm the film festival curator, as well as the board chair at the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. And tonight, I'm joined by two of the filmmakers for an American story, the Norman Mineta legacy. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Diane Fukami and Deborah Nakatomi. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we're looking forward to having this discussion about uh, a project that um, I think within the Japanese American community has has been known about and talked about and much looking forward to um, for a long time, certainly within uh, JACL. I, we were aware of this project coming out for some time. Um, and it was also a pleasure to show it as the closing night film at the, the 2018 Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. Um, so thanks again for joining us here this evening. Thanks, Brad. So um, to get us started, can you tell us a little bit more about your work um, as filmmakers prior to the Normaneta documentary? Okay, so I'll go first. First of all, you know, Rob, the title has changed since we showed it in, um, in Philly. And so when we were on the film festival circuit and we were able to screen it over in Philadelphia, it was an American story, Norman Mineta and his legacy. But when we were able to get a position at, um, at PBS and get an air date and everything, they wanted us to change the title. And the reason is that, you know, those program guides on your TV that you only have so much space. And so they were afraid that if we didn't have Norman Mineta's name first, it might run out of space. So they had to, we had to reverse the whole thing. So now officially it's Norman Mineta and his legacy in American story. So just a little correction there. Uh, my background is that uh, I worked at a TV station here in the San Francisco Bay Area for a really long time. And then when I left, uh, the TV station asked me if I'd be interested in helping shepherd a documentary about the Chinese Exclusion Act. So this was in 1993. So we successfully uh, did a documentary about this Chinese ex the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then after that, I just realized that there was this whole new medium that was not TV news. And so I started producing a number of documentaries for the public television station in San Mateo, California, KCSM. So there was Chrysanthemums and Salt, Tanferan, Starting Over Again, Heart Mountain. Um, and then eventually that all led to working with Deborah Nakatomi and stories from Tohoku. So Deborah, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so unlike Diane, my career as a filmmaker is, is much shorter. Um, it started actually when I met Diane in 2009. We were delegates on a trip to Japan with the um, uh, U.S.-Japan Council's Japanese American Leadership Delegation. And um, it was through that experience that we really had a, a really deep uh, and profound experience uh, in Japan, getting to know the people, the culture, and really getting in touch with our, our ancestry and our roots. And um, fast forward a few years later, uh, 2011, March 11th, when the tsunami earthquake and nuclear disaster hit, um, Diane, we're in kind of a, a unique place to want to help to tell the story of what was happening in Japan related to survivors, but also the connection that Japanese Americans had to this horrible tragedy that was taking place across the Pacific. So our first project was Stories from Tohoku, and it was our opportunity to really help to reveal the um, the, the cultural, uh, the resilience, and the strength of the Japanese people, which really helped them overcome and rebuild um, so much and so quickly um, in the face of total disaster. And it wasn't uh, much, it was actually before we completed that project that this opportunity with the Norman Mineta project was, was kind of uh, upon us. So um, my history is a lot shorter than Diane's. This is my second project. Well, that's really fascinating, though, to think about uh, just sort of the happenstance of, you know, the fact that you did meet on the Japanese American leadership delegation, but then beyond that, um, that you actually had the opportunity to travel to Tohoku uh, prior to uh, the triple disaster. Um, and of course, you know, we know how impactful that that was both in terms of uh, <clears throat> contemporary Japanese culture, uh, but as well as this connection. And I think the special relationship that's been able to be fostered in the last decade or so um, between Japan and the United States. Um, so that that's uh, you know really compelling to kind of hear about that. But I'm I'm kind of curious um, then 
how is it that you came to this project? How did this project come about? Um, obviously, Norm is a, a known quantity in the Japanese American community. So can you tell us a little bit more about how it came into being? Well, you know, Norm has been approached many, many times by filmmakers and, and authors who wanted to write his life story, his career and everything. And, um, you know, living in the San Francisco Bay Area and Norm being from San Jose, would see him a lot at uh, community events because he is so visible and so approachable. And so I had started asking him, you know, Norm, how about a film or a documentary about you? And this is this goes very many years back. And he would say, oh, no, Diane, you know, um, nobody cares about me. I'm just an average Joe. And every, anybody who knows Norm knows how self-effacing and how, you know, how uh, humble he is. And so it took a really long time. And so it almost became a running joke. You know, when we would bump into each other, we would chat and I would say, so Norm, how about that? How about that documentary? He would say, no, no. And then we were at a USJC conference actually in 2012. And I just happened to say, hey, Norm, so how about that documentary? And he said, well, let's talk. <laughs> you know, I was shocked. I didn't expect that at all. Uh, and so Deborah and I set up a lunch date with him in San Jose. And we talked to him for about three hours, he and his wife, Denny, and explained to them how we wanted to approach this, what we wanted to do. And for us, more than a theatrical release, really, it was about a PBS national broadcast. We wanted as many eyeballs to see Norm's story and be as inspired um, from him as so many of us in the community are. And so after a prolonged discussion, um, he looked at us and he said, yeah, I've got my team here. And so we, we were in. That's fantastic. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing to think about uh, for a lot of Japanese Americans. I mean, we, we know and kind of revere Norm Mineta, but um, a lot of folks outside of San Jose even don't necessarily know who he was or, or what he's done, um, not just for Japanese Americans, but really for all Americans. Um, and it's just incredible that you were able to uh, capture so much of his uh, life story into a relatively short uh, runtime as a documentary. Um, I guess uh, one of the, the questions that I had regarding uh, working with Norm, um, obviously he's a very busy man, um, pulled in many, many directions constantly. So how is it that you were able to manage his schedule and over how long period of time did you actually shoot the film? Yeah, well, I'll take that one. So um, as Diane was saying, we actually had to sit down with Norm and Denny in 2012 toward the end of the year, and we were still working on our Tohoku film. So we need, we knew we needed to wrap that one first and uh, before we even started to conceptualize the film and start working in earnest on, on fundraising. So um, we know what a busy guy he is. And uh, we, you know that we had to really spend a lot of time thinking about strategizing and how to use his time most prudently because um, as you know, if it weren't for COVID, he would be crisscrossing across the country as we speak because he is appearing on a lot of virtual town halls and he's he's really, really busy and he's always been in really high demand. Um, but, but as it turned out, um, between uh, 2014 when we actually started the project um, and 2018 when we finished it, we only had four actual sit downs with him, which were interviews. Uh, with him. We followed him around a lot with a camera crew, but actually sitting with him and, and really capturing his attention, um, there were four times. Um, and I think I'm right about that, right, Diane? Oh, no, you know what I just thought of? There was the fifth time when we sat him down in Heart Mountain and we talked to him. Oh, with, with Senator Alan Simpson. Well, um, yes and no. That was when he was in, um, oh, what's that underground place that we the were in? The Root Cellar. About? The root cellar. The yeah. root cellar. And so we kind of snuck into the root cellar. And I think we interviewed him in 2013, didn't we? Yes. So 2013 was the first time we actually began shooting. We had no money lined up yet. But, you know, as, as so many people here who are watching, you know, we are so worried about our Nisei. We, we're losing them all the time. And you know, Norm at that time was in his early 30s, I mean, early 80s. And so we're thinking to ourselves, oh, my gosh, we've got to try to get as much of Norm as we can, you know, while he's still healthy and, and still going. So we began in 2013 and then finished in 2018. Yeah. 
Oh, that's actually a surprisingly short timeline, considering again how much of a incredible story and legacy that he has. But um, you know, I think part of a big part of the the film obviously is uh, making use of archival photos and footage. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you know, for some of the folks who are are less versed in that aspect of documentary filmmaking, if you might tell us a little bit more about um, what that archival research process was like. Were you sourcing some of these photographs from Norm and his family, or um, did you work with Dencho and some of the other archives? Oh God, Rob, that was the biggest pain in the butt <laughs> in the whole archive. Um, there's just so much, and especially with a public figure like Norm, there's a, a lot of things to look at and a lot of sources. So yes, Norm, um, one of the conditions of, of, of doing this is that we told Norm we wanted access to his photos, but you know, the family was very generous, but they didn't have that many photos. Um, and so we hired Amy Watanabe, who's just sort of saved our necks on this whole thing. And she was terrific about finding photos. Um, I for, I've forgotten what number of photos that we've used, but you know, our budget for archival video and, uh, and still images was sky high. It, you know, as you know, because you're in the filmmaking world, that stuff is expensive and really hard to get your hands on. And so we're really pleased about a couple of things. One is that one little snippet where we've got Norm walking through the halls of Congress and that nameplate going on as he first takes office, you know? And then also uh, one of his first speeches after he'd been elected as mayor, we got that through the KPIX archive and we're real happy that we found it. But yeah, it, it's, it was a tremendous challenge to find all that stuff. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, especially when, again, you're looking at a career that's as storied as Norm's has mm -hmm. been. Um, I, so, you know, we've talked a lot about how the Japanese American community uh, knows Norm. Um, and I think for a lot of folks, this was maybe connecting the dots for the different parts of his story that maybe they haven't heard um, just between, you know, the his presence within the pilgrimage movement, mm -hmm. particularly Heart Mountain, but obviously, He's been a longtime supporter of the JACL and is incredibly invested in the leadership pipeline of uh, young Asian Americans in uh, both elected office and mm -hmm. other uh, civil service. But I guess in the film festival run in particular, I'm curious, how was this film received by mainstream non-Japanese American audiences? Yeah. Um, Rob, you're absolutely right. Uh, as far as, as knowledge of norm, I think both coasts, both East and West Coast, uh, multi-generational Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, no norm story. But from the beginning, we knew that our challenge was going to get norm story out to the South, the Midwest, um, the central part of the country that really did did not know about Norman Mineta, didn't know his story, yet we knew that a lot of his career accomplishments and his personal um, struggle and triumphs would resonate with the rest of the country. And it, and it was a challenge. Um, so uh, we were pretty successful in connecting with film festival audiences. So we had an opportunity to be in Texas, St. Louis, Detroit, um, Vancouver, Seattle, Philly, Boston, um, and you know we we were playing to really diverse audiences in those festivals, which was a really great opportunity, and um, and and the response was really warm. Um, it was really um, great fascination, great interest because they felt that they had discovered someone that they had never heard about before. And um, in a few cases, we actually had him with us, which was really wonderful. But I have to say that um, the response from people who were learning about him for the very first time was really, really warm. And you know, when Diane and I started this project, President Obama was in office. And we had conceived of talking points and messaging, and we were thinking about you know, playing to an environment, a political environment and a social environment that was really quite different from what we faced when we launched the film and when it aired on PBS. So um, I think we've been really gratified that audiences like the Ronald Reagan Library, for instance, invited us to be there, invited him to be there as a speaker and a keynote, um, but they, they featured him. And it was an audience of people who were largely Republican, but his story resonated with the audience of students as well as adults that were there that day. 
That's really fascinating, I think, to uh, talk a little bit more about this political environment and particularly um, because you were making the film largely during the Obama era, uh, obviously very different worlds um, had Clinton won that election and the kind of world that this film would have then been released into. Um, at the same time, in certain ways, the film almost plays better at a time when we have such a uh, terrible partisan division in this country. And I think one of the things that has always struck me about Norm, uh, both in my personal interactions with him and um, certainly through the film, this comes shining through very clearly, this idea that um, you, know, you can have these relationships, these working relationships with people from other political backgrounds. And I think um, at no point is it more clear than this friendship between him and Senator Simpson, right? Mm -hmm. And Alan Simpson being a, a you know conservative Republican and Norm being a blue-blooded Democrat. Um, and yet the two of them being able to find commonality in something as simple as um, Boy Scouts and baseball. And um, I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing that this film has managed to capture. Um, and I'm just wondering if you might be able to kind of delve a little bit more into um, have you had reactions, either positive or negative, related to some of that messaging in particular um, in the last couple of years since the film's been out? One of them that comes to my mind, um, because we featured two presidents from two different parties, he served uh, in the Clinton administration and also the administration of George W. Bush. And uh, the, I remember a distinctly a comment, Diane, you might remember where this came from, but there was one comment that we had that they were obviously a Democrat and, and very supportive of, of Norm's career, but they were really curious how it was that George W. Bush was participating in the film at all. And, um, and the fact that he, um, his, his messaging was so aligned with where we are in terms of equity, acceptance, social justice. And there was kind of a confusion about how is it that, you know, we were, we were able to get, you know, a message to come out of uh, President Bush's mouth related to social justice. And, and in fact, I remember that day, you know, very distinctly that um, he felt really strongly about Norm and Norm's service and all of the virtues and values that Norm stands for. And, um, you know, to me, it was it was the real deal coming out of out of his mouth, although, you know, he represents a different party and the party that is currently in power. Um, Norm's family history and Norm's experience with him serving in his cabinet um, really made an impact on President Bush. And I think that that realness, that authenticity really came across um, in, in that interview. Well, I think they enjoy a warm relationship even to this day. Um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do as as a filmmaker and as a documentarian, we didn't want this to look like it was an homage to Norm, you know? And so we very intentionally set out to try to find people who weren't in alignment with Norm or who were political adversaries mm -hmm. or, um, you know, just thought maybe he, he wasn't the best thing since sliced bread. And that was really hard to find. You know, the closest thing that I got was Dan Lundgren. And people wonder, God, Dan Lundgren, why is he in the film? But, you know, because Dan Lundgren had such a big role during the whole um, commission hearings, uh, the Redress and Reparation Commission hearings, the CWRIC, we thought it was important to get that in there. And, and as many of you know, Dan Lundgren did not, was not very popular during that time at all. And so I thought, well, as a political adv uh, adversary, he would be perfect. So when we set out to um, contact uh, Congressman Lundgren, I, I asked him, you know, I was very straight up with him on the phone and I told him what we were doing, why I wanted him in particular, and would he be amenable to an interview? And he said, yes. So when we were in DC, we set up an interview with him and he knew why he was there. And so it's a sort of elaborate setup in a, in a hotel room. And I chat him up for a little bit. And I say, you know, C Congressman Lundgren, can you tell us please, um, what was it like to have Norm Mineta as a political adv adversary? What would you like to say about him? And he looks into the camera and he says, Norm Mineta, the nicest guy you'll ever meet. 
<laughs> and that isn't the response that I wanted from him, right? And so we turn off, I, I turn off the camera and I say, you know, we've talked about this before. I've got a lot of people who are real big supporters of Norm, but because you're on the other side of the aisle and especially because of the hearings and everything, I wanted to hear what you really had to say about Norm and what it was like to be, you know, on the different on a different issue with, than him. He goes, okay, okay, I get it. So we turn the camera back on, I repeat the question, and with that even blinking, he says, Normanetta, the nicest guy you'll ever meet. <laughs> and, and so it was really hard to find detractors of, of Norm, you know, because he's built this reputation of being um, avuncular, of being friendly, of understanding that issues are issues, but that they're not personal. Um, one of the things that uh, Congressman Lundgren told us was that, you know, Norm and he agreed to disagree a lot of times, but Norm never took that personally and he respected where other people stood, even if it, he was in an agreement with them. And for that, uh, Congressman respected Norm very much. Mm -hmm. I think that shines through very clearly, um, not just with him, but really with everyone that I've met who's encountered him on uh, opposite sides of different issues. Um, you know, even with regards to one of the, the latest controversies within the JACL National Convention, uh, Norm spoke um, related to the resolution three. And, you know, I know there are a lot of folks who felt a lot of different ways about that resolution. Um, but again, um, it's such uh, kindness and respect shown on all sides when it comes to Secretary Mineta and, and the way that he carries himself. And um, I think certainly um, almost uh, exudes that level of respect of a bygone era um, that we don't really necessarily see anymore within uh, politics. Mm -hmm. um, thinking a little about the, the Bush era too, uh, one of my favorite stories um, that I've uh, ever heard about Norm um, is the story about the uh, White House briefing after uh, the World Trade Center is attacked. Um, and that idea, you know, suddenly uh, we're at war potentially and there are um, hostile individuals and the idea of, of terrorism within the borders and for President Bush to actually clearly state that you know he didn't want what happened to Norm's family in 1942 to happen to the Muslim American community um, you know I think that that still continues to surprise me uh, about uh, George W. Bush and uh, obviously of, of great credit to Norm and um, his uh, ability to kind of make those really uh, earnest connections uh, to people from, from different political beliefs. Um, and I, I just wanted to share, I actually have a Norman Mineta trading card uh, from that era <laughs> when, when he was uh, serving um, in that administration. Um, but I guess just thinking a little bit more about the politics involved in uh, that particular time and just how political Norm's life has been while also navigating this uh, very delicate balance. Um, were there times as filmmakers that you found yourselves also having to thread that needle between partisan politics while making the film? Yeah, a lot. I mean, you know, it's it's no secret that um, that there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who are not happy with the occupant of the White House right now. But don't forget, our goal was to get on PBS, and PBS is government funded and also at the whim, pretty much, of legislators. And so we were cautioned and very, very cognizant of the fact that we had to be very nonpartisan about this, and it was it was difficult to navigate, especially because. Um, well, I won't speak for everybody. I have some very strong feelings about the, the, the present occupant of the White House right now. And I didn't want to put Norm in a situation where he had to take a stand publicly because that would not have, that would not have served any of us well. Um, so we, we had to be very, very careful to be as fair as we possibly could. And I, I think we did a pretty good job of doing that. And I would just add that Norm, as, as everyone knows who knows Norm well, he has built his career on his ability to reach across the aisle and to bridge divides, especially finding compromise on, on some of the thorniest, thorniest issues. And we wanted to respect that history and that legacy that he had developed. And, you know, he, he maintains relationships all over the country, all over the world, actually, 
with people of you know different political opinions and persuasions. And um, we felt that that was also very important to include that and to not to not allow anyone to feel cut out of the conversation when they see the Normanetta story. Yeah, and I, I think definitely um, based in both the time period that he was in, in Washington, but then certainly the strength of his relationships and just the integrity that mm -hmm. Norm has always demonstrated um, as someone serving in office. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to think, you know, could someone like this really function currently in, in the environment that we're living through um, with this extremely partisan uh, approach within contemporary Washington politics? And uh, obviously that would be a, a question better served to Norm. But, uh, you, know, it's, think, it, you know, I think he would say no. Um, when we first started out, doing this project, you know, we were all very careful about not stepping over that line into partisan politics or anything. And so a number of, uh, there was this evolution that I witnessed anyway. One is that Norm got older and as he got older, he sort of didn't care anymore about, about what he said or who said it. And also he became more disillusioned with what was going on at the, you know, varying levels of leadership in this country. And I remember before it went on PBS, uh, but we were still doing the film festival circuit, we would have to all sort of huddle together and say, okay, remember, we can't say anything really negative. We have to be positive. We're not on PBS yet. <laughs> you know, we don't want them to yank it. And then after we were on PBS and, and that obstacle had been overcome and we're on the film festival circuit and, you know, people like you ask Norm, you know, so what, what do you think is the solution for today? Why can't there be more compromise? Why is everything so partisan? And Norm became much more vocal about where he stood on things and what he saw as the ills of the country. And on the one hand, um, it was very informative, but I thought it was really amusing too. <laughs> well, is it, it, it seems like almost uh, time for uh, part two of the film. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, on that note, I guess um, it's, it's interesting to think about what doesn't make it into a documentary. And um, mm -hmm. obviously, you shot over the course of, it sounds like five or six years and uh, obviously countless, uh, probably decades worth of footage um, in archives uh, that exist of Norm. Were there any scenes that you particularly enjoyed that had to be cut because of the lane? There's a number of things that I wish had made the film. One is that Norm has got this wonderful sense of humor. Um, he's sort of a prankster, he's a jokester, um, and he loves a good laugh. And, you know, somehow we just couldn't in find a way to inject that into the film. And I'm, for that, I'm really sorry. Uh, the other thing is that we had to make a really clear sort of editorial decision about how we were going to handle 9-11. You know, Norm played such an important role in that part of our history. And I wanted so much to focus on his role, you know, with TS, with the formation of TSA, Homeland Security, all that. But it, but we ended up um, just focusing really on the influence that he had on President Bush, and because we thought that that was for, for this film pro probably more important. Um, the other thing that we heard from associates is Norm's strong sense of right and wrong. And, you know, although, as you know, and, and as many people know, he does not harbor any grudge or, or anger about what happened during his incarceration during World War II. But on the other hand, we had occasion to see where that impacted him in a very emotional way that maybe he's not even willing to admit or talk about. Um, we heard from one associate about how Norm had been the keynote speaker at an automotive co conference in Detroit or something. And he, I think he might have been Secretary of Transportation or at least maybe the head of the Transportation uh, Committee over at Congress at the time. So it gives this rousing keynote address, very well accepted. Um, and then afterwards, during just sort of a uh, cocktail conversation, a wife of one of the automotive executives came up to him and praised him and said, you know, that was a wonderful speech. Um, you speak English so well. And Norm said, yeah, you think so? Thank you. And I've got two choice words for you and walked away. Now that probably would not have been appropriate in the film, 
um, nor, nor would it show Norm in a, in a great light. But, you know, it's it just goes to show how deeply he feels things and this integrity that he has. And even if he's going to upset or sort of offend, uh, you know, an executive's wife, he, he's true to his principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, example, and I'm I'm just kind of curious. Um, I definitely want to hear Deborah your answer for that last question too. But um, before that, um, while we're talking about that time period uh, um, and particularly the auto industry, I'm just curious. Uh, did Norm talk much about this idea of the anti-Japanese sentiment that was happening in the '80s and '90s? Because I mean, this was a time when he was in Washington. And the U.S.-Japan trade wars and um, the disagreements over auto imports and the decline of American manufacturing. I mean, all of that was happening when he was active in, in the Hill politics. And I'm just kind of curious if that had come up um, to a larger extent with regards to that sort of anti-Japanese sentiment. You know, we'd never talked to him directly about that, um, but he did talk about the discrimination and and that he felt when he was on the hill you know he talked about people constantly going up to him and asking him for directions not knowing that he was a congressman he talked about people eyeing him warily uh, or thinking that he didn't belong uh, and you know those of you who've seen the film realize that he holds those things very dear for me one of the most profound moments during filming was when I asked very what I thought was a casual question about why he wears that American flag pin on his lapel all the time. And, you know, I thought he was gonna talk about being an uber patriot or something like that. And instead he looks at it and sort of very casually says, oh, this American flag pin, I wear it because I'm a, I feel like a foreigner in my own country. And I was sort of shocked, you know, I was stunned. And I said, Norm, what do you mean? And he said, oh, you know, there are times when I, um, I'm out or in an elevator or something, and you could tell people give you that once over. And so I wear the flag pin so they, they look at my face and then they look down and they know I'm American. And I'm thinking, here's a guy who has given his whole life to public service about demonstrating patriotism to the nth degree, his loyalty, his love, his devotion for this country. And he's still feels like he's got to wear an American flag pin so people understand he's American. It was it was kind of mind blowing. That's a really incredible story. And I think unfortunately one that a, a lot of us can relate to. Um, but, you know, certainly it, it's sorry to hear that that is also the experience that Mineta has felt in his time in Washington. Um, Deborah, I'm curious if you also had a, a favorite scene that uh, didn't make the final cut of the film. Hmm. But, you know, just building on um, this moment when we're talking so much about racial justice and inequity, um, I have to say that there were many occasions during interviews uh, where he would go back to history and talk about his family, his, his parents, watching how his father and his mother um, endured um, over, over years of um, just feeling like outsiders and, you know, growing up in, in San Jose and experiences he had when he was first elected mayor of San Jose. Um, I, I just recall how personal and how present he is about those experiences. You know, people tend to think that you have an experience where you've been racially profiled or, or maligned or discriminated against. And, you know, it's past history. It's 20 years ago and you forget about it. But for those of us who have experienced it many, many times and have seen our parents ex experience it, we realize um, how deep the wounds are. And I know Satsuki Ina talks a lot about trauma and you know how, how we carry that with us so many years later. And when Norm talks about, and we, we included in the film, um, about some of his experiences, you know, he's, he's deeply, deeply touched by it. And what's happening today in America and, and how we're, we're experiencing um, Black Lives Matter and um, trying to do better. Um, these issues are so present right now. And I'm sure that Norm is recalling um, his own experience as, as he's facing the, you know, the current day and the future. Uh, but there were many occasions where 
race and racism and discrimination came up? I can imagine. And um, yeah, again, it's it's so hard when you're making those editing decisions because you've only got mm -hmm. such a, a limited amount of time. Um, sort of related to this, we have an audience question from Aaron Menino who asks, um, any chance of an extended cut of the film that explores those dimensions mm -hmm. of his influence and character that were initially cut? No. <laughs> um, you know, no, and and the the reason why is that I don't think I don't think Norm revealed enough of that himself. We would have to get that from other people. You know, as intimate an experience that we had with Norm, he's still a very private, complex person, and I was kind of surprised to learn that because he's so approachable, so friendly, and seemingly, you know, um, not like a lot of Nisei men who I know and is is very is, is seems kind of extroverted but the more we delved into you know into him and tried to find out more about him the more we realized he's like an onion there's so many layers mm -hmm. and even when we were trying to find out what some of his awards honors accomplishments were you know we had to do research on the internet to find that stuff out because norm didn't talk about it himself so for him to talk about um influence and character that would be interviewing so many other people who respect and regard him highly, but you would never hear that out of Norm's mouth himself. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. uh, enigma, right? Like you wanna sometimes, even as close as you get in the process of a, a six year documentary shoot, there are certain questions that you're never necessarily going to get a direct answer on, uh, regardless of who your subject is. Um, well, we have another audience question. This one is from Robert Shoji, who asks, during your research and interview process, was there anything surprising that you learned that took the film in an unplanned direction? Deborah, anything come to your mind? Hmm. I guess I didn't realize um, the warm personal relationship that President Bush and, and Norm had. Uh, and I didn't I didn't realize that Norm had played a role in influencing President Bush in terms of, you know, the pre the president's stance on making sure that uh, Saudi Arabians, Mid Easterners, uh, Muslim Americans were not detained at that time. You know, so much of what I had known about Norm and the whole 9/11 experience was based on his uh his control over over the, the department of transportation and tsa and all that and so that little nugget you know really turned out to be much much bigger than i had initially anticipated deborah you, can you think of no, that um i think one of the things that um maybe enabled us to go a little bit deeper and that was norm's relationships with japan and uh, we, we know he is of Japanese ancestry and we certainly covered the immigration story of his, his family. Uh, but when we had an opportunity to really explore his connection today with his family in Japan, um, how close he is with his family in Japan, and also to see firsthand through the years of, of making the film, the relationships that he has with, with people in Japan business relationships, personal relationships, and many of them go back decades, like 20, 30, perhaps even longer, 40 years when he was in Congress. Um, he holds on to relationships and friendships, and they hold on to him. And I think that was really evidenced in the, the segment that we did on his connection with Japan, certainly. But we had a screening in Japan that was hosted by the US-Japan Council uh, about a, two years ago. Um, and it was astounding that the number of people, it was five, 600 people, Diane, that filled the ballroom. 700. 700 people that filled the ballroom in, in a hotel in Tokyo. And, you know, he had numerous standing ovations, but they're, they are proud of his contribution in the U.S. Certainly they are proud of all of his career accomplishments. And we hope that we were able to capture that because I think that that's a really kind of unique story that um, that Normanetta, you know, has established himself in, in a way that um, we were able to capture, hopefully. Well, you know, there was a film made a few years before ours came out um, that was done for Japan by NHK. 
and um, the host of it was Ken Watanabe. So already you can you can imagine it was like a you know um, mm -hmm. a, a deluxe production. And um, Watanabe-san had come to the U.S. and had gone with Norm to Heart Mountain and everything. And when it aired on in Japan, it was it was very popular. And so people told us that. When Norm walks on the streets of Tokyo, people who, you know, somewhat during that airtime, people knew him, remembered him, and would like shout out to him. On, he was a rock star in Japan <laughs> because so many people had watched that documentary. And, and, and that was fun to know. But also, we can, you know, as we got to know Norm better, you see that affinity that he has with people. And, and it, it's no surprise. Yeah, I mean, those relationships, uh, it's its incredible in general. First off, how good of a memory that Norm has because, you know, he, it's like a vice grip. I mean, he takes details from 50 years ago and can pull them out. Um, <laughs> yeah. a, a good example of that, the first time that I met him in person, I was at the JACL leadership uh, delegation between OCA and JACL. We do like a joint leadership summit in DC. He came to talk to us. And uh, in the early 80s, Mayo Bachan was uh, uh, JACL Dayton, Ohio chapter president and, and did some lobbying in Washington around the redress issue. And at the time, you know, Norm being one of like three Japanese Americans in DC, of course, um, rolled out the red carpet and, and made all the introductions to their uh, local Congress people. And when they were worn out and exhausted from walking the Capitol Hill, um, he'd let them sleep on the couch that was in his congressional office. So, you know, they had known him for some time. And I was like, I asked him, you know, by any chance, do you do you happen to remember Mayo Bachan? Um, you know, she was from Dayton, Ohio. And he asked me, oh, Yukari Mike Sell. Yeah. <laughs> and like, didn't tell him her name. He just remembered the detail. And, um, you know, since then, every time I see Norm, then he always asks me how she's doing. So uh, amazing. Um, you know, not just in his own direct circle. He has that way of um, keeping, maintaining, and uh, remembering uh, how important those small touch personal connections are. Um, we do have another question from the audience. Um, Ryan Kozu asks, were there any people you wish you were able to interview for this film that you weren't able to film? Yeah, they were. I think, but I think the reason why we didn't interview them is that they had passed or they were not at a, or their health didn't allow us to interview them. You know, there were people that Norm had worked with on the Hill and he worked very closely to get some key legislation passed. And so those, some of those people had already passed on or were in, you know, were not physically able to be interviewed on camera. You know, I would have loved to have interviewed Senator Inouye about the, the camaraderie they shared on, on the Hill, you know, although they were in different houses. Um, Mike Lowry up in Washington, you know, the state of Washington, there were a lot of folks like that, but you know, they just weren't around. Mm -hmm. Well, again, a challenge of making a film that spans uh, seven, eight decades. Um, well, this seems like a good time to talk a little bit about the projects that you're currently working on. I know um, in our earlier conversation, you had mentioned the curriculum guide that accompanies this film. So I'm wondering if you might want to show us a, a trailer related to that. Yeah, we'd love to show the trailer. And also we want to let people know before they see the trailer that there's about 11 seconds of no audio on there because we think we're hoping that you read what you see on the screen and then the audio will pop up. So I, we, we didn't want our viewers to be dismayed at thinking, oh my God, the sound went away. <laughs> so let's go ahead and roll that anytime you're ready. Mom, does that mean that like you're gonna be deported? Like, are you are you gonna have to go back to Mexico? Or are we just gonna stay here by ourselves? I think the challenge about being black or African American in this country is 
we are the position of entertainment in a lot of spaces, but then we're also in the position of like uh, the face of fear in a lot of spaces as well. I just personally want to create change, um, starting on a local level. Um, I don't think I necessarily have to be a politician to do so, but I really do want to um, do some local government work um, in the future. I believe in stakeholder-driven leadership. I think the greatest characteristic you can have is getting diverse people together, listening to everybody and hammering out a solution. But to get there, to get people to bend, to compromise and feel honorable about compromising, they have to agree on a common goal. Japanese Americans can talk about uh, what happened to us and not with bitterness or not blaming the people right now, but just telling our stories so that they knew they can know that something like that could happen out of prejudice. And uh, we all need to work to not allow something like that to happen again. The Education Task Force identified about 30 recommendations that the U.S. and Japan can do individually and together to increase student mobility between Japan and the U.S. It means that, uh, that we value and cherish uh, the right for people to express their will in the public square without recrimination. It means to like believe in American principles like democracy and individual liberty and want this country to succeed. What I believe that it means to be American is being a part of the whole culture itself, just like us uniting together. It's supposed to be a melting pot, but it's not really a melting pot. Um, so that's really sad, actually, just really thinking about it more. And um, yeah, you know, I am American, but it's kind of hard when your country doesn't really see you that way, too. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing the trailer with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how the curriculum can be accessed or used within the classroom context? Sure. Um, first, I, I want to acknowledge uh, Aaron's question. When Aaron asked earlier about what are the opportunities to explore additional dimensions and influence of Secretary Mineta's life, um, this curriculum is one of those opportunities where we've, we've had a chance to really go deeper, dig much deeper into some of the key themes of his life. So you saw a trailer, which is just a, a really tiny taste of six themes uh, that we've developed the curriculum around. And just as a, a review, it's immigration, race and equity, civic engagement, justice and reconciliation, leadership, and U.S.-Japan relations. And this curriculum has been designed for high school and college students and teachers, and we'll be launching it very shortly, in fact, this month, um, to a much larger audience. Um, as we mentioned before, the, the themes of Norm's life we knew resonated five years ago as we were embarking on this, this project, which we call the umbrella as the Mineta Legacy Project, the rich legacy of Norm's life and career. But we had no idea the relevance that it would have uh, today. And we've had a chance to take uh, the curriculum and kind of test, test it with some really key audiences. Last year, we took it to uh, the National Council on History Educators in Washington, DC, and also to the um, National Council of Social Studies Educators um, to, to kind of give them a taste and give them a glimpse. And the response was, was very warm and interesting and curious that there really is nothing like this out there today. And we were really um, encouraged by that, both in terms of the themes uh, involving immigration, civic engagement and leadership, all themes that are so key today and in this time, um, but also that they saw this curriculum as a vehicle so they could get in front of their students in high school and in college 
to enlighten them about how history is cyclical and how history has a way of coming back at us. So um, the, the timing on this could not be better, um, unfortunately, uh, where these, uh, these issues are, are clearly in the mind's eye of the public. So what we tell people is that, um, well, the, the really cool thing is that it's available online for free when we, when we open it up. So we're frantically proofreading and everything, but you know, there's over, there's over 300 images um, there are 23 new, there are 23 videos, and they're not just extractions from the documentary. When we knew all along that when we were working on the Mineta Legacy Project in the film, that we wanted to have a parallel curriculum that was inspired by Norm, but not about Norm, if, if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we interviewed the presidents, for instance, in Stanford University, it, the SPICE program there, uh, they're the ones who developed the curriculum for us. And so when we interviewed the presidents, we tell the SPICE uh, staff, okay, we're going to interview the presidents. What, what questions do you want us to ask them? And so after we finished the questions and responses for the film, we would then ask the ones that were specifically for the curriculum. So we did that with every interview that we had done. The other thing that we did is that we interviewed a lot of students because we feel that students want to hear from other students. They don't want to hear from adults all the time. So we have a lot of students who were involved both on the high school and the college level to share their own experiences. So we're, we're hoping that that promotes a lot of discussion. Um, one of the other odd timing things about this is that although um, we couldn't have judged or foreseen the relevance of the subject themes, we also could not have predicted COVID in our country and the fact that so many um, teachers are going to have to do remote distance learning. And so the curriculum, although it was designed for an on-site situation, is perfectly adaptable for online learning. I mean, it's all online. And so teachers can just give modules or, or assignments to their students and um, we're ready to go. So as soon as we get all of our licenses uh, cleared, because we have so many images, uh, we'll be ready to open up that curriculum. We're hoping, uh, we're not, we're hoping, it'll be for sure by the end of August and we're hoping for sooner. So what we're doing is we're asking people if they're interested in learning more about the curriculum and how to access it, we have a launch page that's already, and it's www, uh, what does it mean to be an American.com. And so, and also if they look at our Mineta Legacy Project page.com, um, they'll see information about how to access the curriculum and also uh, more information about the film as well. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, what a time to be launching an online curriculum. I mean, it's in a lot of ways, you couldn't have asked for a more relevant uh, text for us to be able to share in our classrooms mm -hmm. at a time when I think people need it the most. So thank you both for your continued work on this project. Um, Rob, can I just say something? Yeah. Uh, we fail to acknowledge and thank Tadaima and you certainly and your team. And also you mentioned JCL. JCL has been a partner with us from the very, very beginning. Um, both in terms of just giving us inspiration as we were beginning to think about the project, but chapters and districts all across the country have been on board with us being supportive as donors and um, as real champions of the film and hopefully of the curriculum, as well as OCA, you mentioned OCA. So we have partners that we call legacy partners throughout the country that are helping us to spread the word about the, the film certainly and about the curriculum, but we've been really, um, supported by generously by so many organizations. And many of these organizations are organizations that Norm himself has a really close affinity and connection to. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we value his uh, membership at the JACL. He's been a longtime mm -hmm. supporter and certainly one of our, our most uh, revered members. Um, I think we have one last question from the audience. Uh, Sheila Newland asks, uh, do you happen to know the title and the author of the book about Norm that was published about a year ago? The author is Andrea Warren. And gosh, the title escapes me. It's something, does it have the word enemy in it, Deborah? Do you remember? Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to, am I going to have to Google it? <laughs> but anyway, the author is Andrea Warren. 
So I think if you Google that, you'll be able to find the title pretty easily. And easy. I know it's available. Uh, it is available online. It's on, available on, um, on, on Amazon. It's a great book. We've looked at it. We thought it was a children's book. And yes, it is. It's called it, Enemy it, Child. Enemy, enemy Child. Enemy Child. Well, see, I was half right. And so, um, but she did a very nice job with it. It's, it's really good. Great. We'll have to check that out. And then uh, I just had one, uh, I guess, selfish question. I recently acquired a Norman Y. Mineta congressional desk plate. Uh, wow. And I'm trying to place when in Norm's career this came from. So if you happen to see him before I do, uh, please ask <laughs> when a uh, Hawaiian figurines Norm Mineta desk plate may have come into his congressional career. Was it a gift? Career. That's my only guess. And uh, unfortunately, the, the antique dealer who had it didn't have much else. Amazing. We'll that. put you in touch and you can ask him yourself. You can send a photo. <laughs> All right. He'll probably remember exactly I, where and when. I don't doubt that he will. Um, well, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your time and your talent and um, just keep up the great work. And we're, we're thrilled that um, we'll be able to access this curriculum soon. Um, so, you know, everyone who's watching, please make sure to visit the website and uh, continue supporting the great work of the Mineta Legacy Project. Thanks very much, Robin. Thanks Thank to all the Tanaima staff for making this happen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.